Sooner or later, every philosopher stumbles onto the problem of suffering. We all face pain over the course of our lives because it's nature's way of telling us that something is wrong. At times, this is caused by physical damage to our bodies, which is understandable. If something is hurt, we want to know about it, and the feeling of pain forces us to react. Much of the time, and more frustratingly, however, it's a product of how we interpret the events in our life. This is also important, but this kind of suffering can be unbearable. It can occur in response to a significant event, like losing a job or the death of a relative, or it can persist even without any major external stimuli when struggling against a goal or in moments of doubt, for example. It demands an action, but it doesn't always just go away. Arthur Schopenhauer, one of the big influences on Nietzsche, had a very pessimistic view of human life precisely for this reason. He couldn't find a logical link between meaning and the adverse effects of suffering, and he believed that we were doomed to the human condition. Nietzsche, however, saw things differently. He liked to point out that the only problem with suffering is that we automatically label it as bad. We see it as something to avoid, even though the rational function of pain is to make us stronger. It's actually good for us. Man suffers for a reason. If life has to be meaningful, this meaning can only be derived from suffering. Man, the bravest of animals and the one most accustomed to suffering does not repudiate suffering as such. He desires it. He even seeks it out, provided he has shown a meaning for it, a purpose of suffering. Suffering is the way of life. This is a given supposition. But there are those who suffer but do not find any meaning in their suffering. This is the worst kind of suffering. The meaninglessness of suffering, not suffering itself, was the curse that lay over mankind so far. Nietzsche understood that without the conviction that life has a goal or purpose, many individuals would fall into despair at the thought they are nothing but meaningless animals in a meaningless universe. As such, if you affirm and welcome pain and interpret it how it should be interpreted, then it doesn't need to be that troubling thing that holds you down from experiencing the joys of life. In fact, pain is quite often the fuel that strengthens you to really fight for self-overcoming. You want, if possible, and there's not a more insane if possible, to abolish suffering. And we, it really seems that we would rather have it higher and worse than ever. The discipline of suffering, of great suffering, do you not know that only this discipline has created all enhancements of man so far? That which does not kill us makes us stronger. Survival is not only the means by which we can find purpose in our lives, but that survival is always a strength. In other words, our ability to withstand the suffering, which is an inevitable part of life, is not simply a question of finding meaning in it. Rather, our ability to withstand suffering is developed by prior suffering. Life is all about learning how to evolve our survival strategies, not to shirk our responsibilities and avoid painful inevitabilities. Exceptions exist, but they're unique. The more you fear pain, more problematic it becomes. The more you observe it for what it really is, the more you can detach yourself from its hold. Nietzsche was not a fan of pity or compassion because it was a hallmark of slave morality. In the Antichrist, he says suffering itself becomes contagious through pity, which is a pretty astute observation. Nietzsche thought that pity at all the levels where it occurs, causes us to degenerate. It has a seductive allure because it promises status. If you do something out of pity, you get to look like the Messiah by helping those less fortunate and cement your image as the powerful giver is over against the weak, languishing receiver. There is a certain amount of contempt and pity, which means you get to stand over the person you're feeling pity for. The issue is that this has a degrading effect because if compassion is your cardinal virtue, then you've basically deified weakness. You've made being weak and useless a good thing. The natural conclusion of this is that being strong and successful is now a bad thing. If you are strong and successful, you have committed a mortal sin by being that way. And the only way to redeem yourself is through acts of pity for the sainted riffraff. I do not point to the evil and pain of existence with the finger of reproach, but rather entertain the hope that life may one day be more evil and more full of suffering than it has ever been. To those human beings who are of any concern to me, I wish suffering, desolation, sickness, 
ill treatment indignities. I wish that they should not remain unfamiliar with profound self-contempt, the torture of self-mistrust, the wretchedness of the vanquished. I have no pity for them because I wish them the only thing that can prove today whether one is worth anything or not. That one endures. The social result of this is pretty obvious. It spreads weakness all around because a society that implicitly hates strength and success will slowly fill up with weaklings and losers. In other words, it drags us all down to the lowest common denominator. One shrine as a cardinal virtue, as the basis of morality, it becomes a means by which parasitic people can manipulate those who are stronger and more successful. Creation, scientific advancement, art, culture, and everything else are subordinated to pity. So nothing can be justified except in terms of pity. I remember once reading an article about, is science hitting a wall? This is actually a good example of what happens when we become infected with this mindset. Basically, they were speaking, if we should spend billions of tax dollars on a next generation particle accelerator, gravitational wave detector, or manned mission to Mars when millions of people lack decent healthcare, housing, and education. Notice how this works. It is implicitly assumed that the only legitimate enterprises are those that help the less fortunate. Until the world is perfect and there are no people starving or without housing and healthcare, we implicitly should not be spending a single penny on science unless it fulfills our neurotic pity complex. The person who wrote this article, whatever other virtues they may have, were evidently brought up in a society where pity is the cardinal virtue. And now we have to justify science in terms of benefit to the suffering masses. Wait until the world is perfect, and then you can study things that don't benefit the poor. This whole mindset is broken and sick, but we're still caught in it. Look around at what is happening nowadays in society, where people identify as whatever they want and expect you to believe them, where fat people are okay to be fat only because they are fat, and they are too lazy to lose weight, and you can't say anything about it. We live in weird times. Everyone is so sensitive to the truth and just want to hear nice, comforting lies. For some reason, they believe that if you repeat a lie many times, it will change the reality. We know that's stupid. Only because I say that is not your fault to be overweight doesn't mean you are not fat. It's a mad world out there. Guess we should have listened to Nietzsche. While many people believe that happiness is... The ultimate goal in life, Nietzsche challenges this notion by asserting that humans do not truly desire happiness. He argues that the relentless pursuit of pleasure and happiness is a dull and meaningless way of living. He criticizes the English philosophy of utilitarianism, which focuses on the maximization of total happiness. He claims that only the Englishman is obsessed with happiness, while the rest of mankind strives for something deeper and more meaningful. Nietzsche introduces the concept of the last man, a pathetic being who lives in a time where happiness has been conveniently invented. The last men are content in their happiness but lack any sense of purpose or significance. Instead of pursuing happiness, Nietzsche proposes seeking meaning in life. He introduces the concept of the ubermensch, individuals who create their own meaning and are willing to endure great suffering in the pursuit of their goals. Nietzsche cites examples such as Michelangelo and Nikola Tesla, who dedicated their lives to their crafts despite the challenging and often lonely circumstances. He suggests that these great minds were not driven by the pursuit of happiness, but rather by a desire for a deeper sense of purpose and fulfillment. Psychologist Viktor Frankl echoes Nietzsche's perspective, emphasizing the importance of finding meaning in life. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, Frankel draws inspiration from his time in a concentration camp where he witnessed how individuals facing unimaginable horrors were able to persevere by finding meaning in their suffering. Nietzsche also addresses the paradox of happiness, highlighting that activities solely focused on pleasure rarely yield a significant payoff. He argues that true joy and fulfillment come from the pursuit of activities that are inherently interesting and meaningful, even if they involve suffering. The happiness that accompanies these endeavors is not the primary motivation, but rather a byproduct of the joy found in the process or the outcome. Bertrand Russell, in his book, uh, History of Western Philosophy, 
criticizes Nietzsche's ideas, perceiving them as embracing suffering and lacking compassion. Russell compares Nietzsche's perspective to that of the Buddha, suggesting that an impartial observer would align with the compassionate approach instead. Russell connects Nietzsche's philosophy to fascism and characterizes it as a glorification of pain. Ultimately, the question arises as to whether one should prioritize happiness or focus on finding meaning and purpose in life, as Nietzsche suggests. While some may value other things above happiness, Nietzsche argues that individuals are willing to sacrifice everything for a higher value, such as meaning. Others may disagree and believe that happiness is attainable and worth pursuing. Nietzsche's perspective challenges us to reflect on the nature of happiness and the potential need to prioritize other aspects of life to achieve true satisfaction and fulfillment. Why do you seek solitude? Nietzsche once asked, and as I delve into the depths of his profound contemplations, I'm enraptured by his perspective on the mystical realm of solitude. Nietzsche, a philosopher of unparalleled brilliance and poetic grace, embraced this isolation as a vessel of self-discovery and a gateway to uncharted territories of the human psyche. In his quest to unravel the enigmatic nature of existence, he illuminates the transformative power found in the embrace of solitude. Nietzsche proclaimed, My solitude doesn't depend on the presence or absence of people. On the contrary, I hate who steals my solitude without, in exchange, offering me true company. In these words, he encapsulates the essence of solitariness. It is not merely a state of physical seclusion, but an intimate journey to the core of our being, a pilgrimage of the soul. It is through this undisturbed communion with ourselves that we can expand our understanding of the world, for it is in solitude that we are liberated from the distractions that cloud our clarity of thought. When alone, I become an ardent explorer, venturing into the recesses of my mind unencumbered by external influences. The cacophony of daily life fades into background noise, leaving the stage open for introspection and the pondering of life's greatest mysteries. Nietzsche believed that the path to self-discovery unfolds in moments of solitude, as it is here that we encounter the dark recesses of our own thoughts and emotions. Through this confrontation, we gain insight into who we truly are and develop a profound understanding of our innermost desires and aspirations. Yet solitude is not a refuge from the complexities of life. Instead, It is a battleground where we face our most formidable adversaries, our doubts and fears. It is in these moments of strife that we discover our strength and resilience. Nietzsche understood the significance of this personal struggle, asserting, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. When confronted with difficulties, it is in solitude that we confront our why and forge an unwavering will to persevere. We unearth the wellsprings of our inner fortitude and transform adversity into a stepping stone towards personal growth. Nietzsche's life was one of solitude. His later period in life was spent almost in complete isolation. At the age of 24, he was offered to become a professor of classical philology before completing his doctorate or receiving a teaching certificate. He remains to this day among the youngest of the tenured classics professors on record. He taught at the University of Basel from 1869 to 1878. Nietzsche's poor health worsened, and he was forced to leave his professorship. He had also felt that academic life was a hindrance to his creative thinking. He retired with a modest pension of 3,000 Swiss francs, which represented two-thirds of his annual salary. The pension, though awarded for only six years, was actually paid in full until 1889, the year of his mental breakdown. This money was Nietzsche's main source of income for the remaining years of his productive life, spanning from 1879 to 1888. In his period as an independent philosopher, he plunged into his creative work while plagued with continued ill health. Nietzsche's personal attitude involved a hidden and solitary aspect of his outward persona. Carl John writes, I was held back by a secret fear that I might perhaps be like Nietzsche, at least in regard to the secret which had isolated him from his environment. Perhaps, who knows? He had had inner experiences, insights which he had unfortunately talked about, and had found out that no one understood him. In a rare praise, Sigmund Freud noted that Nietzsche had a more penetrating knowledge of himself than any other man who ever lived or was ever likely to live. 
Nietzsche traveled frequently to find climates more beneficial to his health and lived in different cities as an independent author. He spent his summers in the coolness of Sils Maria, Switzerland, and his winters in the warmness of the Italian cities of Genoa, Rapallo and Turin, and the French city of Nice. He also wrote many letters to his colleagues. However, for the most part, he was alone. Apart from writing, he used to take long walks that could last several hours. Nietzsche considered himself as the solitary wanderer and hermit, the free spirit that had experienced a great liberation from the traditions that had kept him chained. Solitude became the origin of a new category of thinker, a philosopher of the future, a free spirit. We are the born, sworn, jealous friends of solitude, of our profoundest midnight and midday solitude. Such kind of men are we, we free spirits. And perhaps you are something of this yourselves, you who are approaching, you new philosophers. He further elaborates that one has to remain master of one's four virtues. Courage, insight, sympathy, solitude. Because solitude is a virtue for us since it is a sublime inclination and impulse to cleanliness, which shows that contact between people, society inevitably makes things unclean. Somewhere, sometime, every community makes people. Base. Nietzsche indicates that only a few people can bear solitude, but these will be able to harvest its fruits. Solitude has an aspect of a sense of belonging that is not present in the crowd. Being physically isolated, however, does not imply automatically and instantaneously getting rid of the social imprint because society not only makes an appearance outside of oneself, but also within oneself through a common conscience. It is an inner voice that contains the norms and the habits that prevail at the civic level and, to a greater or lesser extent, condition our way of speaking, interpreting, reflecting, acting, and in short, living. That is why Nietzsche urges us to reflect upon this inner voice that conditions our life, and that is only possible in solitude. Flee, my friend, into your solitude. I see you dazed by the noise of the great men and stung by the stings of the little. Forest and rock know well how to be silent with you. Be once more like the tree that you love, the broad branching one. Silent and listening, it hangs over the sea. Where solitude ends, there begins the marketplace. And where the marketplace begins, there begins to the noise of the great actors and the buzzing of poisonous flies. You have lived too long near the small and the pitiable man. Flee their invisible revenge. Against you, they are nothing but revenge. In this alchemical union of solitude and hardship, we embark on a transformative journey where our true selves emerge from the crucible of life's challenges. We discover the boundless depths of our own individuality shedding societal expectations and audaciously embracing our unique existence. Nietzsche believed that it is in this radical self-acceptance that true liberation is achieved. In this journey of self-discovery, you may be frightened, frustrated, and bewildered, but trust me, it's worth it. The price of solitude may be high, but the reward of truly knowing and owning yourself is beyond measure. Choose the good solitude, the free, high-spirited light-hearted solitude that, in some sense, gives you the right to stay good yourself. In Nietzsche's view, friendship within a romantic relationship is essential for its success. It goes beyond mere affection and shared interests. It involves actively helping each other become better individuals. This type of friendship breeds honesty and growth as both partners push each other to reach their highest potential. A true friend does not shy away from criticism when necessary. Instead, they offer guidance and constructive feedback to steer their partner away from harmful paths. Nietzsche suggests that a lack of friendship is at the core of the worst marriages. Without this strong foundation, couples may find themselves drifting apart, unable to communicate effectively, or lacking a sense of purpose within the relationship. Without the support and encouragement of a, a true friend, the challenges and hardships that come with any long-term commitment become exponentially more difficult to handle. Furthermore, Nietzsche emphasizes the importance of conversation in marriage. He asserts that everything else in a union is transitory, but conversation is the cornerstone that holds it together. Physical intimacy and shared interests may bring temporary satisfaction, 
But the ability to engage in meaningful dialogue with one's partner is what truly sustains a relationship over time. It is through conversation that couples discuss their values, make important decisions, and establish a shared vision for their future. Without the ability to converse effectively, the relationship becomes shallow and lacks the necessary depth to navigate life's challenges together. Nietzsche has focused on conversation as a decisive factor in choosing a life partner is astutely insightful. It forces individuals to reflect on the compatibility of their values and beliefs with their potential spouse. While physical attraction and shared hobbies may be enticing at first, they pale in comparison to the importance of being able to communicate openly, honestly, and authentically with one another. A lack of compatibility in conversation leads to misunderstandings, constant disagreements, and even the erosion of trust within the relationship. To him, the ability to have deep, engaging conversations that span a lifetime is indicative of a solid foundation for a long-term partnership. It highlights a level of intellectual compatibility and emotional connection that can weather the storms of time. It is through conversation that couples learn from each other, challenge each other's assumptions, and continue to grow together. In essence, successful long-term relationships are built on a bedrock of friendship nurtured through ongoing conversations that foster personal development and mutual understanding. All right, so Nietzsche, this German philosopher dude, came up with this concept he called the Overman or the Ubermensch, not to be confused with some kind of cosmic taxi service. Now, he wasn't talking about an actual superhero with a cape. He was diving deep into the human psyche. So the Overman, or Ubermensch if you want to be fancy about it, is like the upgraded version of humanity, the next level in our evolution. Nietzsche was all about breaking free from the conventional ideas and rules that society threw at us. It's like he was saying, hey folks, let's transcend the norm and become the rock stars of our own existence. This Overman isn't held back by herd mentality or trying to fit into society's little boxes. It's about embracing your individuality and creating your own values. Nietzsche was all about flipping the bird to conformity and saying, I'm not just a piece in the puzzle. I'm the Picasso painting the whole darn canvas. Imagine the Overman as the rebellious teenager of humanity, questioning authority, challenging norms, and going, you know what? I'm not just a sheep in the flock. I'm the shepherd leading this rebellious parade. It's not about being a power hungry maniac. It's more like taking responsibility for your own life, being the author of your story instead of a passive character waiting for the plot to unfold. Nietzsche was like, why be a spectator when you can be the director? Now, don't get me wrong, it's not an easy thing to do. The Overman has to face the struggles, the uncertainties, and the chaos of life head on. It's like saying, bring it on, universe. I've got my own script and I'm ready for the plot twists. In a nutshell, Nietzsche's Ubermensch is all about kicking conformity in the philosophical butt, embracing your uniqueness, and writing your own life story. Less superhero cape, more rebellious spirit. It's like saying, I'm not just part of the human race, I'm running my own marathon, and the finish line is wherever the heck I decide it is. Imagine a world where we're told to not only accept our fate, but to love it. It may sound strange, but that's the profound concept of a more fatty coined by the brilliant Friedrich Nietzsche. He believed that to truly find meaning and embrace life's challenges, we must develop a deep appreciation for everything that happens to us, both the good and the bad. This perspective encourages us to not only accept our existence as inevitable, but to love every single aspect of it, even the pain and suffering. Despite facing numerous challenges and hardships, Nietzsche consistently expressed his love for fate and his ability to find meaning in the midst of difficulties. One notable example is his struggle with recurrent health issues, including severe migraines and ultimately mental illness. Despite these afflictions limiting his productivity and causing immense suffering, Nietzsche embraced them as essential aspects of his existence. He believed that his physical ailments and mental struggles were necessary for his philosophical work shaping his unique perspectives and allowing him to delve into the depths of human consciousness. Nietzsche's embrace of his fate enabled him to transform his suffering into inspiration and fuel for his philosophical ideas. In doing so, he exemplified the concept of a more fatty, 
illustrating how one can find meaning and purpose in even the most challenging circumstances. He understood that life is tough. And it's easy to fall into despair when faced with adversity. But he argued that by embracing a more fatty, we can transform these experiences into opportunities for growth and self-improvement. Instead of dwelling on past mistakes or wishing for different outcomes, embracing our fate allows us to redirect our energy towards personal development and inner strength. Now, at first glance, loving pain and suffering may seem completely absurd. Nietzsche knew many wouldn't understand. But he believed that by refusing to accept and love our fate, we limit our potential for growth and happiness. He famously said, My formula for human greatness is a more fatty, that one wants nothing to be different, not forward, not backward, not in all eternity. By fully accepting the present moment and refusing to wish for something different, we can find contentment and meaning in our experiences. A more fatty is closely tied to Nietzsche's larger philosophy of overcoming and self-improvement. He believed we should constantly push ourselves to surpass our current selves, always striving to exceed our limitations. By embracing our fate, we can learn from our past, take responsibility for our actions, and move forward with a renewed sense of purpose. Challenges become stepping stones on our path to personal growth. Embracing a more fatty requires us to shift our mindset from victimhood to empowerment. Instead of feeling like the world is against us, we recognize that we have control over our responses to events. Nietzsche believed that by loving our fate, we regain control over our lives and see negative experiences as opportunities for growth and self-discovery. This philosophy also challenges our conventional idea of happiness. Nietzsche argued that true happiness isn't found by constantly chasing a state of bliss. But by embracing the entirety of the human experience, imperfections and struggles included. By accepting our fate, we find beauty in the chaos of life, appreciating even its darkest moments. To conclude, a more fatty is a thought-provoking concept that encourages us to love and embrace our fate, including all the ups and downs that come with it. By seeing challenges as opportunities, accepting life's trials, and taking responsibility for our own happiness, we can navigate the complexities of existence with a profound sense of purpose and fulfillment. Nietzsche, one of the most groundbreaking philosophers of the 19th century, boldly declared, God is dead. These three words have resonated throughout history, stirring emotions, evoking thought-provoking discussions, and challenging religious and moral foundations. Nietzsche's provocative statement encapsulates a profound shift in thinking about the existence and relevance of God in our modern world. This video will explore the beauty and intrigue behind Nietzsche's proclamation, delving into its historical context, profound implications, and why this declaration remains relevant today. To begin with, Nietzsche's assertion that God is dead must be understood within its historical context. Born into a deeply Christian family, Nietzsche was immersed in religious dogma from a young age. However, as he grew older and underwent immense personal hardships, like studying philosophy during a tumultuous period marked by scientific discoveries, he began to critically examine long-held beliefs. Nietzsche found himself questioning everything he had been taught about religion. Thus, God is dead appeared to be an inevitable conclusion for him, a poignant summary of his transformative journey from certainty to nihilistic uncertainty. The significance of Nietzsche's statement goes far beyond its literal interpretation. It serves as a powerful metaphor for the crumbling faith in traditional values and institutions prevalent during his time. In an era characterized by rapid industrialization, scientific advancements, and the rise of secularism, many individuals felt alienated from the comforting embrace of religion. God's disappearance symbolized humanity's shifting dependence on faith and divine guidance towards an existential void. Nietzsche's bold claim also addresses the definition and perception of God itself. By stating that God is dead rather than stating that God does not exist, Nietzsche highlights humanity's evolving belief system surrounding spirituality. Instead of assuming God never existed at all, an argument commonly espoused by atheists, this proclamation suggests that society has moved beyond such metaphysical ponderings altogether.
Alongside its philosophical beauty lies an inherent tragedy. Nietzsche recognized that leaving behind the traditional worldview anchored in God's existence came with consequences. Getting rid of God inadvertently removes any universal source of meaning and values. By humanizing this widely held transcendental force, Nietzsche confronts individuals with the notion that they must forge their own purpose and ethics independent of religious convictions, a prospect both awe-inspiring and terrifying. More than a century after Nietzsche's declaration, the debate surrounding God's death continues to provoke contemplation. In today's interconnected world, religious diversity has drastically multiplied compared to Nietzsche's time, allowing for an even more extensive exploration and challenging of different faiths and beliefs. His statement, rather than being relegated to a bygone era, has endured as a catalyst for discussions that dissect the nature of existence and wrestle with metaphysical inquiries. In the end, Nietzsche's famous words, God is dead, go way beyond just trying to shock us. They ignite discussions and touch hearts in ways that stretch way beyond their short sentence. When we place this bold statement in its historical context, think about what it might symbolize, consider how our ideas about spirituality are changing, and realize that it still matters a lot today, we start to see just how amazing and intriguing it is. People all around the world still wonder, is God really gone? These words keep us thinking and talking, showing their incredible power and beauty. Nietzsche's warning about the domestication of man strikes a chord as I consider the path we've chosen to follow. We have, indeed, lost touch with our primal nature, much like the wolves that transformed into dependent dogs. In our modern world, we have distanced ourselves from the wild, from the untamed aspects of our humanity. The daily grind of office work, with its repetitiveness and lack of variety, has confined us to a realm where we are increasingly separated from our natural instincts and intuitions. The act of locking ourselves in offices, embroiled in repetitive and often mind-numbing jobs, bears a striking resemblance to Nietzsche's notion of the last man. These jobs not only take a toll on our physical health but also chip away at our psychological well-being. The overwhelming drudgery and absurdity of such work can indeed drive one to the brink of madness. It's no wonder that many seek detachment through various distractions or coping mechanisms. In The Giver, by Lois Lowry, we encounter a world where everything is meticulously controlled by the government, from what people eat to what they see and know. In many ways, this parallels our own existence. We are increasingly subjected to external control and manipulation, from the information we consume to the products we purchase. Our individuality is under constant threat as we conform to societal norms and expectations. Nietzsche warned of the loss of morality in a domesticated society. And I see his point. In our quest for comfort and security, we have neglected the dangerous aspects of life that used to shape our moral compass. Without challenges and adversity, we become complacent and morally disoriented. We are, in a sense, becoming cute but kind of useless, like the domesticated dogs Nietzsche alluded to. In the past, humans lived in close-knit tribes, finding meaning and purpose in the bonds with family and close relatives. In contrast, modern society has fractured these connections. We are so engrossed in our individual lives and digital distractions that we often feel out of touch with both our external and internal worlds. The bonds that used to provide emotional and psychological support have weakened, contributing to a pervasive sense of isolation. The domestication of man, as described by Nietzsche and exemplified in The Giver, is a troubling trajectory. It leads us away from our natural roots, confines us in monotonous routines, and subjects us to external control. This process erodes our moral compass and weakens our social bonds. To counter these effects, we must be mindful of our choices, seek balance in our lives, and rediscover the wild, adventurous aspects of our humanity that have been subdued in the name of comfort and security. 